going? Yeah. That, that it sounds like there was an opportune sort of lull in the conversation for which uh, we should launch into our session. Um, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Thomas and Slay toko ingoa. I'm the community manager at Digital New Zealand, which is um, a team within the National Library. And my colleague Amy Watling from the Alexander Turnbull Library, which is also part of the National Library, are going to uh, facilitate this session. Um, I'm just going to start with a few uh, housekeeping things. Um, Bex is our TUI team member here. So she's going to run the mic, but Amy and I are also going to um, run this mic around as well. But please remember to speak into the mic if you have a question, because we are obviously live streaming um, this event. There's also um, a Google Collaborative Doc. Um, I believe the link is just on this, the program page um, on the website. So if anybody, I'm not going to like nail you down, but if anybody wants to take some notes or um, find that a useful place for keeping track of the session, please do so there. Um, the way Amy and I are going to uh, run this session is much more of a kind of a kind of collaborative, open discussion. Uh, we don't want to stand up here as a font of all knowledge about copyright in relation to the glam sector. Um, what we're going to do is kind of intro the session with a couple of pieces of work that we are engaged at the moment and use these kind of as prompts for bigger discussions um, around the sector. It's going to be quite kind of high level, some big questions. And um, yeah, we really invite you to uh, come with um, ideas and examples and, and other questions for the audience um, as, we, as we go along. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge the session that ran before that I went to about Maturanga Māori, which um, dealt with some issues that we're gonna talk about uh, in, the, in this session as well. Um, and yeah, just say that all ideas are welcome. This is a really open floor. Uh, to everybody. I've also been um, prompted by Nicola just before to encourage everyone, I think it's the room just next door, is the so-called um, community thinking room. <laughs> Sounds slightly Orwellian, um, but we encourage you to uh, go in there and write, uh, write something if you have ideas that come out of this session. Um, they're kind of collating stuff there. Uh, so um, Nicola wanted to encourage everybody to, to go through um, afterwards as well. So, um, I'm just going to do a brief intro about uh, Digital New Zealand and my work there, and then Amy's going to take over, and from there we're gonna, we've got a couple of questions to kind of prompt and open up the session. Um, so, yeah, as I said, my role at Digital New Zealand is the community manager, and for those who uh, don't know, Digital New Zealand is a content, we call ourselves a search service or a content aggregator. We um, work with over 300 different collections across the country and we um, bring together uh, on one search service over 30 million items. Um, and, and, and that's sort of one half of what we do. And the other half is that we have an open API through which um, people can access the metadata of those collections and build other services um, with this data as they see fit, fit other search services or um, access portals, I guess, to this information that we're bringing together. Um, Digital New Zealand still has, I don't know if we still have, but we did have our tagline, which was to, to make New Zealand's digital information easy to find, share, and use. Um, and I was really struck by actually a, a point that um, Corey Doctorow made in his uh, opening keynote. And forgive me, I don't think Corey's here, but forgive me if I'm slightly misquoting him, but he did say, um, I liked his distinction between information wants to be free and people want to be free. And I believe he said uh, that people want access to free, fair um, and open information. And I, I, that really struck me and I wrote it down because I really feel like that is um, part of Digital New Zealand's co-papa is to really make information accessible to people, um, to New Zealanders and people and, and international people as well. Um, so I also wanted to kind of make the point in my opening kind of precy that uh, the glam, the so-called glam sector, our slightly saucy um, acronym for um, <coughs> those who don't know is galleries, libraries, archives and museums. And we are kind of brought together into this, into this acronym, but the work that Digital New Zealand does, I think, really underscores that this sector is very diverse. We have a lot of um, different needs, um, different material that we're dealing with, different ways that our work intersects um, with copyright and the Copyright Act. And um, yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge that diversity as well as the things that, that bring us together. Um, so I'm just going to talk about two very brief uh, pieces of work that we're doing at the moment um, at Digital New Zealand. So 
Uh, as part of our ethos to make um, it very clear for people how to access and use information, we have a series of usage terms on our website and people can filter the information using these different terms. Um, so currently they are uh, uh, all rights reserved, share, modify and use commercially. And my colleague Michael Ascarides, who is the user experience lead um, at Digital New Zealand, he's, not, he's actually gone to the user experience session. Um, he's been undertaking some work to um, refine and refresh and work on um, these filters. So we thought, um, Amy and I thought in this session it would be a nice way to kind of talk about some of this work and if anybody is interested in seeing that, please come and have a talk to me afterwards um, and or uh, have a chat to Michael. But the real, um, p the real purpose of this work is to make sure we're really clear around usage and very respectful um, and very uh, um, permissive but in a way that balances those um, permissions with our responsibilities um, as uh, our responsibility as an aggregator and the responsibilities of the institutions that we work with. Um, so the second piece of work that I just wanted to share briefly was also on Digital New Zealand. We have since our inception, and we're actually about to turn 10 this year, so it's our 10th birthday, um, we've had a series of uh, guidance on the site called Make It Digital. Um, and this was, it's it's about copyright, but it's also sort of generally about digitization um, and making your uh, collections available online. And um, we're looking at how to uh, refresh and um, and make this uh, make this service even better. And uh, a question that I had sort of generally for the group here was around um, the tools that people are using in the glam sector in relation to copyright and where the Make It Digital service can kind of sit within the framework of tools that we have as a sector. Um, so that was a kind of a, a, a question I wanted to sort of put to the audience. But um, Amy is going to talk in relation to that about some work that um, the, uh, Alexa, uh, the National Library is doing also in relation to rights statements and then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Thank you everybody. Um, Thank you to NetHui for this space. Thomason's idea was that we propose this session and we were really pleased that it was accepted. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, the Alexander Turnbull Library um, has a piece in the National Library Act, which we all quote constantly at work, which is um, our mission, which is to collect, protect, preserve, and make accessible uh, our collections as uh, keeping in mind the estate as its tanga. Uh, and what, um, I've been at the library for about 10 years, uh, and before that I've worked in archives and in public libraries. So I'm a, I'm a librarian to the core. And my part at the moment of that work is in the front and make accessible. Um, but we all work very, um, from the front we work back and we work forward. So the, the whole chain is very closely tied together and you can't have one without the other, right? Um, and what I like um, to do is to break down barriers for our users. And when I came to the library, the biggest barrier that we had was uh, discovery. Um, people had to go to a number of different places to actually search our collections. And they had to know where those places were for the different types of material that they wanted to look at. Now we've been working on that for 10 years and it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than 10 years ago. And, um, but that progress on that, as so often happens, uh, revealed the next barrier, um, which is people can find things better now and they really want to use them. And traditionally, our library's users have been dominantly academic users that we might expect to understand uh, their responsibility and their uh, risk under copyright law. And that has, is moving out and out and out. And the library's understanding of our, their users is moving out and out and out so that we can um, now say, well, we, our decision making is based on the fact that our users are everybody. Um, and also not just New Zealanders, but anybody interested in New Zealand content and the content that we hold about other places as well. And people find things and then they have a barrier because we are not telling them how to use them. So the library's gone through a process of assessing the DIPLA statements, and that's the Digital Public Libraries of America, also Arapiana, um, have worked together to come up with a set of statements that are designed for item-level um, digitised or digital material um, that appear in aggregators like Digital New Zealand, Arapiana, Trove, so forth, um, to uh, 
uh, say to users, firstly, their statement, so their statement of fact, you can put them in the metadata. Um, they're just saying what the status of the work is. But to them, you can then attach advice to say, the status of the work is in copyright. That means that. And so that means that Digital NZ and the National Library are working in very much the same space when we're saying, well, how do we interpret these statements for users? Um, and we very much want um, to work in, we're, we're kind of third off the rank here because Te Papa and Auckland Museum are also working very actively in the space kind of ahead of where we are slightly. And we want to catch up and we want to work together. So we, my vision, which is not um, necessarily the endorsed version, but um, what I'm seeing as the end goal is um, all of the GLAM sector in New Zealand have available to them this uh, set of statements that we can all use and we're all offering the same advice. And that might not seem like a massive thing, but at the moment, if you go and try and use things from different collections when they have been, where they're available digitally, you will see that a multiplicity of advice. And you'll see the same things appear in different places with different statuses and different statements, and you'll see blanket statements that, you know, only apply to 10% of the material that's up there. So I'm really interested in um, that work and also uh, the work that we've done with Dipla means that we, Dipla did not have a statement for cultural sensitivity for what we've called ethical and cultural considerations. Um, the US have legal protection for indigenous IP, uh, and so they have a blanket statement saying other legal, out of copyright, other legal protections that they are using, but we do not have that legal um, backup. And so we are saying that we want to add two statements to this work. We want to add um, in copy, out of copyright New Zealand instead of using the public domain mark because that's shorter. <laughs> um, and we want to add a cultural and ethic, ethical considerations tag, statement, warning, advice thing for the out of copyright material. Because as um, was really demonstrated in the Matauranga Māori session, I think, is that term is not, a, not very meaningful um, thing to say in terms of Māori material. Oh no, it's out of copyright. Well, you know, how much does that mean to an iwi? So um, we have a question to kick you off. Um, so Amy and I, we were thinking of some quite big picture questions, kind of kickstart the conversation. Um, and we wondered if anyone wanted to contribute uh, what kind of a successful reuse of GLAM collections looks like to them and or their organisation. Victoria. Yes. Um, well, we've released uh, images of our collection for I mean, how many, three years now? We've had about 18,000 reuses, um, well, downloads um, that we know about um, annually. Um, and we've asked people a question about how they're using those works, why they're downloading it, and they fall into three main categories. Um, I call it the collector, the copyist, and the creative. So uh, the biggest group is the person that just wants a copy for no reason at all other than they like it. They just want to collect it. It's the Pinterest type of person. Um, and that's the, the what looks to be the main main group. Um, and then there's a subset. And the next set is the, is the copyist, the person who's not going to alter the work or do anything with it other than copy it. And it might be for a book. It might be for a podcast um, logo. It might be for a blog. It might be for anything, um, you know, an avatar, anything like that, just copying, no changes to it. They're just copying it. And then the rarest of all for me, and the most interesting for me, is the creative, where they take um, one or many um, works where that can be made into derivative works and do something fun with it. Um, and that fun thing can be anything from um, a collage to um, an animation to you know various part, parts of creativity. Um, and you know even as simple as a, as a meme can be really... Um, fun way of seeing your collection be used by the community out there. Yep. Oh, 
Is this on? Cool. Yeah. Hi, Kira. Um, I'm a big user of Digital NZ. In fact, I'm a raving fangirl of Digital NZ. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your work. Um, I use it mostly for researching history, both of my own whakapapa. So I want more than just when they're born and they died and they're married. I want what did they do in between? And you're the archive that holds it. Um, I love that you're going to give them something that resembles copyright advice because a lot of the stuff I find there I want to copy and I want to use and I want to share because it's, it's my tipuna and I want to... And, but I find that the photographer died 150 years ago but there's still all rights reserved and I have a conversation with the people who supplied this to Digital NZ and they don't get copyright in the slightest and, and just having something with a doc gov.nz, not your org, but hey, something that is, has something that resembles a little bit of advice would be wonderful to point them at to say, because I've had some really aggressive, no, you can't have this as the holder of the original, we will sue you. And I, I just don't think it should be like that. So thank you for changing the tone, please. Thank you. Um, one resource we do have on Make It Digital is the photography copyright flow chart. It's one resource and I there's, you know, potential to do more, but that does follow, tries to follow a fairly easy um, kind of diagram from which you can determine copyright status. So that's something, you know, we would really like to promote further. Yeah, and as um, a, a holding organisation, the, the Alexander Turnbull Library, um, you know, I, I love the, the resources are out there where you can look at your thing and what you know about it and then you can follow a chart and go, aha, at the end of it you have some kind of answer. Um, but what I would also really like to see is at the level that of discovery, at the level where the persons come to the item and they see the big beautiful thumbnail and they see some metadata, um, that at that point, it's saying this is this kind of item um, and that's coming out of the metadata and it's also a con controlled vocabulary. So, you know, we can build the advice on top of that. That means that you probably want to do this. You probably want to do that. If you want to do this kind of thing, you might need legal advice. Um, and those DIPLA statements are all, um, uh, are all linked back to URIs. <laughs> um, but that brings us to another issue because we've got those two statements we want to add and we need a home for those pages. We need a home for the, those URIs. So we want to talk to people who wants to host um, out of copyright New Zealand and um, the cultural protection mark or whatever it is that you want to <laughs> call it. Okay. Um, my day job is at Te Tarita Whenua uh, Department of Internal Affairs, so I would love to help you to find a place if we could talk, anyone else? Thanks, great. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on, on um, um, something that Brenda was talking about. And I, and I often wonder about the tools that we have and how primitive they are. Mm -hmm. um, and the amount of effort that goes into clearing an image. And then, you know, I process collections which have got hundreds of thousands of things in them. And we, you're, they're of uncertain um, lineage. So, um, you know, like it's Herculean. And at what point do we just kind of give up or change the paradigm because we just can't do piecemeal clearance it's it's going to take us forever and you know the to-do pile is getting bigger um you know the cleared pile is not growing at the rate of the to-do pile so i wondered if everyone else had a similar problem and and what do we do about it because it's a growing problem for me <laughs> i saw you raise your eyebrows victoria <laughs> um i totally totally get where you're coming from um and and I think it depends on what type of collection you're dealing with about how easy it is to make those judgment calls. Um, from I'm just so to be clear to everybody, I'm the person that does that at Te Papa. Um, I make the calls in terms of whether something gets released or not, and what type of right statement goes on it. Um, and to be brutal, some it's it's quick and dirty at times, and at other times it can take months slash years, um, depending on a risk assessment. And that risk assessment for me has been built up by 10, almost 12 years now of experience about when somebody might come back and moan. Um, so uh, it is a risk assessment. It's like this is obviously where you can and you can absolutely be sure that it's out of copyright with no um, cultural sensitivities, um, then it's up and out and, and tagged and gone. Um, the real difficulty, difficult bit is the bit where it's not obvious, where it's not obviously in copyright and it's not obviously out of copyright and you have to do a whole stack of um, work around who made it, when was it published, um, was it something that could be published. Um, yeah, it's 
so I, I totally get where you're coming from. I don't think, though, that we can give up, per se. I think um, there's something to be said for building the relationship where, where items are in copyright and you know, and you can actually find the estate or slash artist or um, owner of those copyright rights. Um, yeah, so uh, there's, there's kind of a, a chi, a middle way there that you have to f get comfortable with. Um, yeah. But so, I mean, I don't disagree. And, and I think when it's a unit object, someone's collection, someone's works, you know, I think that that's that's logical. And I think that's definitely where we have to find um, uh, efficiencies. It's when we're doing things like, I mean, is the future going to care about what Twitter said about the general election? And if they do, who owns which bits of what? If we go and collect a tweet, who owns the comment? Who owns the image that off-linked? Who owns, you know, so they become this swelling out net of things. And then, I mean, notwithstanding, we collect the whole of domain. So once a year we go and trawl.nz and we put it away and we go, this is a really big problem. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> oh, well, here comes next year. Um, you know, like at some point we're going to have to do something about it. Yeah. We can look at all of those collections since 2008. We estimated if you unpack everything, there's a billion things in there. And they're off our territory as well. So, you know, we can kind of sit under the legal deposit mechanism which allows us to deal with things sanely. But the reality is, is that these are hybrid, mixed, vast collections of phenomenally complex objects where who knows... Ah, you know, it's it's, and it's not going to get any easier. I think is my point. You know, yeah. today we yeah. know it's a problem. The the internet isn't getting simpler. Twitter isn't getting less weird and complicated. It's you know these things are diversifying and getting larger. Um, the only thing I can say is we have a copyright reform. Let's do let's put that in there as as a as an issue of concern. I think um, one of the things that um, I mean I, I I'm really interested to find out what Deloitte has got to say about um, fair use. But I was <sighs> crestfallen once again to be left. Um, I noticed that the L was in there, but they missed the G and the A and the M in that um, report, and it just makes me want to slip my wrist. But, um, you know, because I, I just feel that, that libraries have got these great exceptions that, that um, museums are sitting there, like, sometimes looking at with envy and other times going, well, it doesn't really apply to us. Um, so, yeah, the, I think there's definitely something to do, something in that space where we need to talk to about copyright reform in terms of getting some kind of public good um, exception in place to allow us to deal with the, the types of content that you're talking about and, in fact, all of the content that we deal with. I'd like to take it um, a little bit, somewhere a little bit different. I know that we haven't solved that. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Next five minutes. Yeah, I think it is. Um, I think a lot of the conversations we're having now are around the collections we already have. Um, and as libraries and archives, we have the privileged position that we can um, copy for preservation purposes. So a lot of this content we're talking about, we really want to open up access to it, but we have the content and we have, uh, to an extent, the ability to look after it. But this born digital content that's being created now, um, we're privileged to work at the National Library, we're under the National Library Act, we have an exception, a certain set of exceptions to the Copyright Act that allow us to do things like collect the web and collect content from the web. Um, we're increasingly talking about how that shouldn't be the role of any one institution, but we're the institution that has the exception under a different act altogether. And so I think there's something in the reform of the Copyright Act that needs to capture the ability to capture uh, what's happening in contemporary culture and what's being produced and make that more democratic than what we currently have. Thanks, Amy. Um, there is a meetup after um, today uh, around GLAMS and copyright reform specifically. Where is that again? At the library bar from 5.30 um, with a particular focus on how we Where else? collaborate going forward from this event in the context of the um, copyright reform but it doesn't have to be solely on that topic. Oh, it may be indeed. Oh. Yep. Okay. So, around the corner to, is that Tory? Is it on that corner? And then go up the lift from there. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> okay, I just want to um, uh, pose another question. Um, and I'd like to hear from some different people as well on that one. So, um, I know because I, it's difficult because I know we've got a, knowledge, a lot of knowledgeable people in the room. But I want to give 
lots of people a chance to have a say. But um, my question, when I run into barriers within my organisation around um, is it our job? Is it our job to give people copyright advice? Um, and, well, it's resource heavy and it's a fair question to ask because anything extra we do costs us people time, costs us, you know, um, all, that kind of, all that kind of stuff. And we've got a lot of things we want to do, so we have to weigh it up. And um, people say to me, oh, there's the act, you collect, protect, preserve, make accessible, and it stops. <laughs> and um, I say to them that uh, advising people about reuse comes in under protect. Um, for a start, you are protecting the creators of the material that's in copyright because you're telling people you can't do whatever you like with this, and we do digitise in copyright material for access. Um, so people can, it's not, it's not just all the old stuff <laughs> that's coming out um, that people can just grab. And the other, um, the other thing being that we protect the users um, there. We're not um, just giving them this sort of, oh, well, that's your, that's your business. Um, we're also, under that circumstance, not making it obvious that that's what we're here for. You know, if nobody uses the material, we're stuck. Um, what are we here for? So I wanted to ask, what what do you think that glams, um, what responsibilities or what we should be doing um, around um, reuse and rights, you know? Thank you. Um, the other thing I'd say is, do they care? Do our users care? Um, you know, a lot of people are using the internet more and more, and we're making our, our content more and more available. That's our goal. Um, we're reaching beyond our traditional audiences and that kind of thing. So, you know, it, is it our job to look after the whole internet and, and all of these new people that are coming? But I think the counter argument is um, we are here. So I'm from Te Papa, um, so a slightly different, sorry, another Te Papa person. Um, uh, we have a slightly different act, um, but it's along the same kind of lines of, of actually enabling um, new culture to exist as well and to understand uh, um, previous culture to shape the new New Zealand. And to do that, it includes digital literacy, which includes copyright literacy and all of those other kinds of things as well. So I think it's, it's not just about copyright. It's about enabling um, New Zealanders to use the resources that we have in a way that's useful to them and useful for society. So I think it, it kind of it's not a library or museum or a copyright question, it's part of that bigger bigger picture. You say, um, again, I was sort of struck um, with Corey Doctorow's keynote where he said something along the lines of it's never useful to rattle your sabre at your audience. And I don't know whether we've been, uh, in the past, we've, we've rattled our sabre, sabres a bit too much and maybe it's, yeah, it's not productive. Um, Victoria carries one around. <laughs> in her back pocket. <laughs> um, Sort of in connection to that, uh, Adrian and your uh, your proposal about new culture, um, Bronwyn, I'm I'm not hope I'm not picking on you because <laughs> you're sitting down the back and hopefully probably just wanting to enjoy the session. But um, for those who don't know, Bronwyn has a big exhibition um, at the City Gallery and she is an active um, user of heritage materials. Um, and I wondered, Bronwyn, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of your experience of recently, yeah, using some of our services. Uh, kia ora everybody. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, so I've just recently had an exhibition open at City Gallery that's on until the end of July called, it's part of This is New Zealand, and my project's about the Southern Cross Cable, which carried 98% of New Zealand's international internet traffic for 17 years, all by itself. Um, so a lot of that project was researching the history of that cable, and also, at the same time, I stumbled across a mural that a Wellington artist, E. Mervyn Taylor, made for an earlier cable station, the Commonwealth Pacific Cable, in 1962. And this was commissioned by the government and since got taken down and put in boxes and forgot about. So I went through this process of restoring and then that led to a book on all the other murals that he made, which led to me spending heaps of time at Archives New Zealand and Alexander Turnbull Library and National Library and getting quite familiar with the systems for finding things and also knowing a silly amount about copyright because of another thing that I did in the past. Um, <laughs> running into these, these walls where... Um, I would have to go through processes to get permission to reuse things in the book or in the art project. Um, 
when I knew they weren't under copyright. And, I mean, part of it is National Library are great because they've got a really easy system to use for logging in and requesting a high-res image file by, you know, one of Duncan Winder's really amazing interior shots from the 1950s and 60s. Um, and that was great, and I didn't mind paying a $30 fee because I saw that as a service fee, but kind of wondered whether that was how it was promoted. Um, and I don't know, what else can I say? Anyway, I found Digital NZ really easy for making sets of things. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. Was there anything specific that you wanted to know? Oh, I'm just interested to see if there's other user stories as well um, mm. about, uh, you know, barriers that people have faced or things, questions that they've had. Because I, that is a big sticking point for me. Um, I've been trying to marry up the free intellectual and the free monetary. Mm. Um, and I, to no avail. And there are some kind yeah. of grey areas as well. For example... Um, there were some like microfiche or really, really old copies of Women's Day or um, film stills from um, the National Publicity Unit that, um, yeah, we kind of got to a point of like, do we, do we use this and risk prosecution or not use it? And I mean, that to me stepped into a an area of potential censorship in terms of telling a nat national history story. So, yeah, I don't know if that helps. But. Does anybody else have a user story? Um, I clear government copyright with the stuff that's in our collection from the government. Um, and as a user, in terms of trying to get copyright permission from government agencies, it's a freaking nightmare. Um, I've got to say, it's it's harder dealing with the with government than it is dealing with the most towy artist. Um, <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, and it's because you can't get anybody to put their hand on their heart and say, OK, I'll take responsibility for that. Yes, it is Crown Copyright. We are the inheriting agency. I know it was six agencies ago because it was done in the 1950s. But, uh, yep, we inherited it. Yep, I'll take responsibility for that and I'll make a decision as to whether or not to give you, another Crown agency, a licence to be able to reproduce that on your collections online so the people of New Zealand can see it. Drives me nuts. Just another user story. Every week I work with Jesse Mulligan and Nicola Torkey on the radio on the Critter of the Week segment. I'm their behind the scenes Wikipedia support. And we decided it was really important since all these endangered species are out there that they have a Wikipedia presence so people can find out what they are. And it's been sometimes a nightmare and sometimes a joy to try and find information, especially images. And I'm particularly glad that Auckland Museum releases all of its collection um, images of species under a Creative Commons license that allows for commercial use, which is, if you didn't know this, you can't put anything in Wikipedia that has an NC license. Right. So it's been enormously helpful that, that they, they and Landcare Research have also made mass digitization of their beautiful moth butterfly collections. Uh, but much of my time is spent wrangling with uh, other organizations and individuals and living, giving short copyright lessons and Creative Commons lessons one at a time, one person at a time. So I feel the pain of people who have to deal with <laughs> individuals in this context. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, got another question over here. Uh, just another user story. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily... Uh, it's, it's basically just getting across one aspect of how uh, an artist might feel when approaching a digital collection. I did an animation of, a couple of years ago using a public domain image from the Alexander Turnbull Library, but also using a very old uh, audio recording from Natonga. Um, and uh, there was no public domain notice with the audio recording, but I really wanted to do my, I really wanted to make this animation and, and uh, put this idea into action. And so I decided not to ask permission first, <laughs> but rather just to take it and use it and then ask for forgiveness later, simply because I didn't want to be told, no, you can't use it, uh, or kind of 
uh, ask permission without even knowing if I'd be successful in the experimentation that I want to be doing. So those are just some of the ideas that might be going through users' heads, and um, yeah, I don't know if that uh, helps necessarily. Yeah. yeah, we've got over here with Louise. Uh, my question's not from a user perspective, but as us thinking about how artists or the producers of contents, particularly galleries, can help make their content more user friendly, or what you'd, advice you'd give in, you know, lodging things to archives and thinking through, yeah, what are the best ways to make this process easier as the content producers? Um. So, do you mean, uh, do you mean, so what sort of content are you, sorry, we need two mics here, now we're going to talk to each other. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I guess from my experience it would be images and publications, so writing and images of artworks and thinking through, and obviously in consultation with artists, but how, yeah, best might serve these and maintaining that they're, I guess, archived and have a presence, but also have a use. Yes. Um, so it kind of connects to another question we had is about licensing frameworks. Um, so if we do have Mandy here from Creative Commons. So um, Creative Commons is obviously a suite of licenses which enables uh, future reuse in a kind of, um, in a clear kind of framework. Um, and so that's kind of discussion you could have with artists at that stage of um, producing work, whether or what sort of life they see ahead of the work, how they envisage it being used and reused. and the modular nature of Creative Commons allows for various, um, you know, differentiations of that in the future. So, um, and then I guess in terms of uh, archiving, there are various institutions who offer, a, you know, a service which you could use. Um, and digital, again, again, Digital New Zealand is an access point, so we can go out and and um, look at your collection and make it accessible via the Digital New Zealand search service as well. Um, did you have anything to? Um, with, um, as well, artist groups, and I know Victoria will probably have quite a bit to say on this as well, it is great to grab the creator um, when you've got them, because Creative Commons can only be applied by the creator. And I think that's a, something a lot of GLAMS institutions don't understand, because you do see the institution putting a CC license on things. Even if it's CC zero, um, and they're just, with the best will in the world, wanting to make it obvious that they had don't want, want to put, put any barriers in the way. The, the fact of claiming, putting CC0 on claims that they have some kind of involvement in the creation of the work. And we're very lucky in New Zealand, we don't have the same kind of question um, or quite so um, controversial a question in, in Europe. And Europeana is dealing with the fact that if a gallery, for instance, takes a photo of a 3D work, um, uh, intellectual property accrues to that photo different from uh, the original work. Whereas in New Zealand it is, um, that is not explicit in our, uh, our copyright law. Um, so we can, as, as digitizers, um, we can uh, just say, well, the copyright of that photo that we have taken the, the purpose of that photo is to be as close to the original as possible and re reproduce it as faithfully as possible. So why would we claim anything for ourselves in that photo? Why would it not be just the same as the original work? And I think that that is um, a prevalent idea in New Zealand. It makes me very happy, but it can still happen. Can I just make a quick yeah. correction? I think you meant 2D, not 3D. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so, sorry. Um, I, yeah. I personally don't think we should be claiming rights in 3D either, but that shows it is an active debate, I yeah, realise that. that. That's the yeah. active debate. The bit where there, there isn't in New Zealand is whether an exact copy of a two-dimensional work has any copyright. And I think... Um, well, there is there are times when it's still debated, but for the most part, the glam sector seems to have come to the conclusion that there is no new copyright, unlike in Europe. Yeah. Oh. Kia ora. Um, there's a particular type of, of library of education resources where, and this is one of the things you touched on, it's not just creators, it's institutions as well. So if you're a teacher, you can share your resources in POND, 
um, especially YouTube clips, creative stuff, wonderful things. But that's only if the school board of trustees says, yes, this is a good thing. So you've got an institutional barrier to people being able to actually get things. So it's quite frustrating if a teacher creates a resource for a school, moves to another school, they may not be able to continue using that resource. So um, whether this is something that government or whoever needs to look at, it's just ah, a, a, a barrier that I'd really like to have overcome. Um, just a question. Um, are any GLAM institutes using CC0 in New Zealand? No. no not that I, know I think of. Mandy would know. <laughs> oh. I, I personally would like to use CC0, but New Zealand Goal doesn't let me, well, um, recommends against it. I'd like to have it as one of my portfolio um, possibilities. Um, I've had chats. Um, with uh, various people over in government about that. Um, and I think it, it, it's it's something I would like to see as part of um, part of the New Zealand goal, maybe version three, in terms of um, having that available to government. Because it would be nice to be able to say, okay, we might have copyright, or we do have copyright in this particular um, iteration of this, this work, and um, we're actually going to say, no, we, we won't you know, worldwide, go for it. Cool, I think we've got some points over here from people we haven't heard from down the back. Just a, a couple of thoughts and things. Um, so I'm from the, more the licensing side. So um, I'm from the, um, the PMCA. So we actually operate a licensing scheme to allow organisations to, to copy published works and the like. So just with your comment about Women's Day, um, so um, can help you out there. So that's, um, the, the rights that content's owned by Bauer. Um, and so the scheme that we operate is actually for um, organisations and businesses. Um, so there's the line of whether you're working in the personal private capacity or you're using it for commercial purposes. If it branches into that, then it's something that is covered by an existing licensing scheme. Um, the other thing is um, you're talking about, um, I guess, kind of as, as librarians and, and people working in that area, um, do you educate people in, um, you know, how far along the chain does your, you're providing the, the content to them, mm. um, letting them know how they can use it. Um, but even if content has then been, um, uh, I guess, kind of received or used in, in that kind of personal, you know, you go into a library or something, um, but if that's being used commercially, that's again something that needs to be considered and perhaps in the mainstream that's actually not something that people are aware of. Um, I'm aware that I sound like a total fangirl when I say something about Cory Doctorow's keynote again, but <laughs> well, I am. Um, but uh, I was also struck by his point where he talked about um, a 12-year-old Harry uh, person writing Harry Potter fan fiction, um, wanting things to be clear for them as to they don't. I think Adrian's point. They don't really think about what they can and can't do. But I think it would be great if using um, a collection item in their in a 12-year-old's uh, school research project, it was really clear to them at the point at which they access it what they, that they can do that. Um, yeah, so we'll write some fan fiction about it, potentially. Was there someone, did you have a point at some stage? Yeah, sorry. Well, one thing I was going to say is, I think earlier someone said that only a creator can apply a Creative Commons license to a thing. It's a rights holder, actually. So you have to be the person who actually owns the copyright, which, uh, assuming that some of us do create copyright works for our jobs, is often actually our employer. So keep that in mind. Um, Artists who are sort of operating independently might be operating under one framework where they are in fact going to own their copyrights. But the vast majority of copyright works that are being created are being created in the course of our employment and are therefore owned by our employers. Uh, since Mandy just spoke actually, one of the questions Amy and I were thinking about in relation to this session was, um, we, Creative Commons has become, you know, widely used across the glam sector now and we've seen, definitely seen like a massive pickup in the use of Creative Commons licenses over the last 10 years or so. But we were really keen to hear from organisations who have used those licenses and or other models um, as to what, what, they, what was most useful for them and their users um, in the current state of play in that area, if there was anyone. Victoria? <laughs> uh, and we've got Mel Melanie down there too. Afterwards. Um, 
we've chosen, well, we have chosen the um, most restrictive Creative Commons license for the material that we own copyright in. Um, that doesn't seem to have hindered people from reusing the material. Uh, that said, I think, um, and um, it, we are acutely aware that we need to revisit that and look at actually what the risk is in terms of what's happened in the past five years of us using that license um, and what have we stopped happening that we actually want to encourage happening. The no derivatives in particular I've got a problem with. I'd really like people to be more creative with our stuff. Um, so uh, that's something we want to look at. And there's also uh, a bit more analysis that we should be doing on what actually, why are we putting the NC on? We, should we be more targeted about what we're putting the, the no commercial on? Is it something, when do we want to reserve our rights to commercialise something and when, do, when is it okay just to let it go? Um, so there's a bit of unpicking there that we have to do as an organisation as well, but I think that's um, that's a bit of work that's that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of tied into, however, getting the getting the um, time and as far as programming is concerned to get the um, the platforms that we supply these the rights messaging out on updated so that we can actually add these extra um, rights a more a more um, segmented rights framework and essentially that's why we're getting involved in the DPLA statement work that the National Library is doing and why we've got something programmed hopefully shortly um, in order to update the system so that we can take advantage of the work that we're doing on the DPLA statements. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say something probably going to offend some people here but um, I always find these discussions uh, in the glam sector, um, how can I say this, it's on the one hand very open and you know wanting to make things available and so on and on the other hand I find it as a lawyer acting for people who are very very careful of copyright highly conservative um, I, I often wonder what is it that people are so worried about I mean what's what's going to happen if you release these things are you going to get fired or slapped on the hand or are people not going to make them available anymore or you're certainly not going to get sued right so ah uh, no but there's the you're not seeing the proliferate of relationships that we have with communities and individuals that we have to respect in order to do our work um fine art heaps of relationships there that if we screw up will be screwed <laughs> you know um there's this yeah what, explain what you mean by screw um okay it's it's more that if if you you have to have a relationship with an artist to get an exhibition up on the wall you have to have a trusting relationship they're putting their creativity and their self they're exposing their creative um will out there and really we're just we're providing a conduit through which they can express themselves and that's a very trusting relationship um the last thing we want to do is disturb that um, by getting ourselves into a situation where we're reproducing an image where they don't feel their work is being truly represented. Um, there's other other relationships out there too as well where we have long-term trusting or building, trying to build trust with these communities. Um, hapu, iwi, whanau um, relationships are merely one um, community set. Um, yeah, the list could go on and on and on. And I think it's um, the conflict and the expectations that people have of our type of institution. They're for one, in one situation, they're going, "You're, I paid for you. You know, I'm a taxpayer. I want everything, um, and you know, I've already paid for it. Uh, and it is not your job to stand in the way. And as professionals, as information professionals, you know." It, we believe that very strongly as well. But on the other hand, we are very much reliant on donors and on those relationships. We could never, National Library could never build our collection, the collections that we need based on what we can buy. Um, so, yeah, and, and so the people out in the community have, and so the same person can have the same opinion. Uh, no, I expect you to protect that material, but give it to me for free um, without any rights restrictions on it. Um, and because we start from a position of conservatism, and um, because of the history of those institutions, that's what makes it so difficult to move away from. Uh, just we've got about five minutes to go, and I think Marilyn, do you have a, do you have a point that you wanted to make? Oh, I think Amy's got the mic, you go. You go, it's all right. 
Thanks. I was just going to say, in terms of the last thing, pretty much if we're not government departments, we're local government departments, they're not big on risk, you know? Yeah. And this, yeah. this is yeah. perceived as risky, you know, by that standard, yeah. I mean... I yeah, I think yeah. I agree with you in that. In that, it is incredibly conservative. I think um, I took a gamble when I decided to allow the publication of Orphan Works. Nobody else in New Zealand was doing that when I made that decision. I thought, right, what is the risk to Te Papa of this happening? Um, and I argued that the risk was really, really slim. Um, and I've been proven again and again and again that that is the so, that is so. And I've been preaching to the probably much the converted in the in the sector and trying to reassure people, but I'm still getting queries, this time from local institutions or smaller institutions, how much risk is there for us to reproduce it? We're really scared of copyright. You know, how much work, research work do you have to do to ensure that you're not going to infringe on people and get people aren't necessarily scared of the lawyers or scared of the course of the of the court case. What they're scared of is some irate person coming and banging on the front desk and yelling at them. Reid, uh, speaking of smaller but very excellent institutions, I think we should um, possibly just hear from Reid before we w wind up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a, you know, I'm with a local government, you know, um, a public library, but um, we've released things on um, a Creative Commons 3.0 license for five, six years now. Um, a lot of those are, I think, probably, you know, Risky, you have a, a reasonably high degree of risk, which I think major institutions probably will pull back from, but we've never had any problems, um, none at all. And that's not to say that the same thing would apply to bigger institutions because of your higher profile. It's not to say that we've been totally cowboy about it, but as somebody who got very nervous about doing this, you know, basically, we, we, our stuff's been used, it's been published and stuff. Nobody's ever, ever come back to us. And, um, you know, maybe we have less um, uh, institutional prestige to worry about if we do get our, our fingers, you know, slapped or something than a major institution. But I can only say from our experience that, um, you know, it, you, you can be, take more risks there. And all we've generally got back is, is public response, including from people. And I get your point about people complaining, but... Um, but yeah, I've always been nervous. Somebody will say, how come they're using our image or our image of our family, et cetera. But even when people have definitely known about this, they haven't minded by and large. Certainly with the kind of stuff we look after, people like to see their history, their stories getting out there and told and not buried hidden in an archival vault somewhere. Yeah. Thanks, Reid. I think, I believe we're about at time. Oh, have, we got, have we got 10 more minutes? Um, OK, thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, I was just going to say in relation to Reed's point, Upper Hutt City Libraries is a really amazing example of community engagement um, in relation to your online collections. Read a lot of your programs that you've run and talking to people and going out and um, doing in-person events around your digital collection is really inspiring examples, I think, in relation to that. And it all kind of connects up to the licensing in a really holistic way, I think. Could I just add one? Just add one quick thing, is that um, one thing we do get a lot of use nationally and internationally of our collections is um, images and publications from the 1950s, 1960s and stuff because that's so rare and people will use ads from our local newspaper to illustrate something. Now, I'm quite nervous about that. I'm not sure how that falls in copyright, but these have been published by, you know, we De Papa have approached us, all sorts of institutions, and it's just, I think, really, there isn't a risk there. It's very rare that somebody, you know, is going to claim on something like that. It's an old vacuum cleaner ad from 1947, but um, it's, so, you know, um, but nobody else is making that stuff available, and, you know, we are being hunted down by all sorts of people to use images like that because, you know, I don't know, we're willing to take the chance, Yeah. Thanks. Amy. Um, the point I was going to make earlier, I think, has been covered, which is the people who are putting this stuff out there and taking that risk, they don't seem to have it coming back to bite them so far. Um, but one of the risks there is that um, this idea of diligent search and that we don't really have a definition of what that is. 
Um, so in terms of copyright reform, that might be an area that we want to advocate for. Um, but there may also be something there around a community effort to make a statement about what diligent search is. Um, we did a survey within the Lianza Standing Committee on Copyright last year about what people's problems were, and Orphan Works was a really big one. They don't know what diligent search means, and a lot of smaller places do not have the resource to do a diligent search, especially if that looks completely different for everything that you're doing. Um, and one of the suggestions that came up quite a lot was some sort of register where you could say, this is something that we're wanting to make available. We're making a statement here to say, we'd like to make this available. If you've got some issue with this or you know someone we could talk to, then let us know. So having some sort of public register around these projects could be um, an avenue we could explore. That's a great idea. <laughs> that for me is the key issue. I would love, love, love something like that. But it seems to me that we need to think broader in terms of copyright reform. We need to think some kind of exception for these public good behaviours that our institutions are essentially created to do. Um, it seems to me that every time we try and respect the rights of copyright holders, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, I'm absolutely for that, for those negotiations for licences. I'm talking about the orphaned works situation where even with a due diligence search, you still don't, you still can't find anybody. I mean, in those instances, I would say that that a public register would be useful in terms of uh, tracking back, because the amount of times I've actually managed to trace somebody five years after I published something is, is, I mean, I've done it enough to actually realise that that can and does happen quite regularly. Um, but for me, what I'd like to see is some kind of exception in place to allow us to do that type of behaviour without having any um, come back to us uh, or you know, any risk at all. Because if we remove the risk, then you get um, and we identify what type of institution we want to have that behaviour with to be able to do that type of work, then we'll be in a situation where it's uh, you, it's actually a, a good thing for the copyright holders out there because they might get their works identified and connected back to the rights holder. The problems I've always had, well, it's not problems. The three times I've been, four times I've been contacted by um, people who have made themselves known as the copyright holder of Orphan Works. Um, none of them knew, well, three of them didn't know they were the copyright holder, I had to tell them. So it's it's those situations where you want to say, you want to connect back to them, to give them, to essentially let them know that their rights exist, um, but at the same time have some way of doing that in a way that actually works in today's world. I, if you isn't on the internet, it doesn't exist. I, the, Victoria's partly raised the point I was going to, which is the difference between, or the, the issue I see between institutions making a decision to take some risk and the rights holders' rights, you know? Um, I, and yes, if you're talking about orphaned works, that's one thing. But actually, if you're talking about copyright holders' rights, where you, they exist, they're a person, you could find them, but you're releasing material without talking to them at least, I, that issue, I'm not sure, it seems to be getting a bit muddled, I guess, is what I'm, and maybe I'm just, yeah. We keep giving away our microphones and now we both have a microphone. But, um, Melanie, I, I want to acknowledge that point because it's around um, the uh, where a copyright holder exists um, and you can find them. Um, just when we were talking in the Mataranga Māori session, we haven't really transferred on in or brought that topic up here, but um, it seems pretty inevitable that the copyright reform will examine Y262. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity to do that, but it, it's that... It's that thing of the we've got this material. Technically, it could be an orphan work. It could just be out of copy, easily established as out of copyright. But we do want to find somebody um, to talk to about this material before we license it, or be well, not license it before we put a status on it. Before we say it's out of copyright, go for your life. Um, and that's that's link, linking up to what Melon is saying about the rights holders that we do know. If we're not doing our due diligence there, how successful are we going to be and how are we going to be able to build in those systems where we say, well, we've got to find somebody to talk to, we've got to find the right somebody to talk to about 
uh, material depicting Māori or created by Māori. Cool, so I do think we have to wrap up now. Um, thank you very much for everybody for your contributions here. I think it's been a really great discussion. Um, I think uh, someone's been tapping away, potentially taking notes on the shared doc, so do check in and um, have a look at some of the notes that we've um, created. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the, the day. Kia ora.